thank you so much for this opportunity. I very much enjoyed Dr. Ball's talk, and I'll try to stay fair and balanced, just like Fox News when I talk about metastatic RCC. And it is indeed true, while we're waiting for the true randomized trials from the URTC and Carmina, we should not really hold our breath too much because some of them are really accruing quite slowly, and we may not have the results for a while. I do miss 2001 when the approach was quite simple. You have a tumor, we have a study, it shows we have two studies, it shows advantage to the cytoreductive nephrectomy, and we go ahead and do it. And a decade later, we have this uh, very helpful diagram, as one would call it. But nevertheless, let me focus on this very area on the, uh, on, the, on the left of the diaphragm. When we look at this beginning of our progress and the beginning of our decision making, relapse in stage four or medical or surgical unre unresectable disease, these are different patients. We start our treatment paradigm with a very mixed bag of fruits and oranges and apples, and I don't even know what else is in there. And I can assure you it's not a pumpkin. There will be some very angry oranges that we need to pull out out of this group. And we do have prognostic models. We do have a very nice MSKCC prognostic model by Dr. Mortar, and Danny Hang has done a great job with his group with the International Consortium. But one thing we need to see is, although these patients are well separated into the risk groups, these criteria were not designed for patients with synchronous metastatic RCC. And I think it is very important. As much as we lean on these criteria, we cannot necessarily stratify patients by synchronous metastatic RCC. If you look at this very table, the Time from diagnosis to targeted therapy in years was 1.4 years. We don't have 1.4 years in patients who present with synchronous RCC. Take a look at the data again by the International Consortium on those patients from the, that from the treatment to less than one year. The median overall survival is only 14.7 months. We do not have 14 months to start. Take a look at Alex's Baxter study. These are all in the form of the abstract and the ESCO. Poor risk is 8.5 overall survival, and we have only 15 months before these patients die. And I'm very happy that this is truly recognized by the medical oncology colleagues, because as we can see here, the recent paper by Mortar and the BJC shows that those that were treated less than one year, 7.4 patients had a median month of, of, of progression-free survival, and only 16 months, again, consistent with the prior two abstracts I just showed, before they die. So if we do not proceed with something fast, and if we do not commit early, I think we may be losing a little bit of a time, because on patients who have eight months to leave, if we subject, subject them to a trial of the drug first, we may not have the time to recuperate. And let us take a look at the group from MD Anderson, 10 years data, and his group, and take a look what we have. 50% survival, these are outcomes of patients with metastatic RCC, treated with targeted therapy without cytoreductive nephrectomy. Granted, many are half are intermediate, half are poor risk factors. And take a look here. We have less than a year for these patients to live. So what do we do in a targeted era? If we give them the, if we give them the drugs first, less than a very few patients have 30% uh, or more in response. And while it, while it co correlates with the overall response, it is certainly not enough to make us say that let us use the targeted therapy first. If we look at those patients and proportion of those will present with the IVC thrombi, the level of the thrombus is much more likely to increase rather than decrease in the area of targeted therapy. And then we're truly taking somebody sick and, uh, and subjecting them to a much more challenging surgery. A little bit of a basic data, while we have some very interesting studies from several institutions, including Harvard, Eric Jonish's group recently showed a rapid angiogenesis onset after discontinuation of sunitinib. So what we have here is the proliferation of endothelial cells, and those patients, once we stop sunitinib, as they, the group described, maybe there is some sort of a rebound effect of endothelial cells, and maybe indeed our angiogenesis is just taken out of control. Are we really doing anything good. 
Babuza yesterday gave, gave a fantastic talk, and he suggested to put, th put things in boxes. And uh, unfortunately, I can't fit my patients in boxes, but if we try it, we will look at tumor factors. We will look at location and number of mats, patient factors, markers, and we will have to decide how we're doing with the cytoreductive reductive nephrectomy. And again, these are tumor markers. We're looking at the uh, we're looking at the site of metastatic disease, at the patient factors, at the other things, and I'm, I will not have enough time to go over all the data where we try to look at the prognostic criteria. Indeed, we do know that the tumor burden is indeed important, and Dr. Bowser appropriately pointed out that a patient with a tiny renal mass and a large metastatic burden should not undergo cytoreductive nephrectomy, but we do know indeed that the more tumor we removed with nephrectomy, the better chance that they will do well and it has been shown in several studies. It is very important to appreciate the work by Shuk and others from UCLA that the ECOG is a very important prognostic factor. And this ECOG is study after study, and the canoptic performance status is study after study that it's very important, probably one of the best and most predictive things. And again, if one is sarcomatoid, then perhaps there should not be operated. The issue is, if you look at over 400 patients done at uh, MD Anderson, we cannot adequately and preoperatively pre with the needle biopsy state whether or not they have sarcomatoid RCC. And in fact, less than 10% of patients were adequately and appropriately diagnosed with metastatic sarcomatoid RCC unless we do a saturation biopsy of the big mass. So here's the study that is supposed to help me out, and I thank Tony Chiwari for putting it in and uh, having it published, that we have a cytoreductive nephrectomy on survival of patient, and indeed patient with cytoreductive nephrectomy appear to do well. Uh, while I was at the NCI, we actually wrote an editorial that the median time to treatment in this group was five months, and some patients treated as late as 17 months after surgery. Just because this patient had cytoreductive nephrectomy, these are not patients with synchronous metastatic disease. And unless we understand the behavior of synchronous, we will not be able to do too much of a progress. And uh, this is a courtesy of John Leppert, who presented this data yesterday. And indeed, the no cytoreductive nephrectomy have done uh, worse than those with cytoreductive nephrectomy. But take a look. We're indeed a very different patients, and our selection bias is quite strong. And it doesn't matter that we do propensity score analysis. And I can take as many square roots out of the sick patient. I'm not going to take a, a, a sick patient, a healthy patient, by subjecting them to mathematical methods. We should not forget a very important and a very practical scoring algorithm by Leibovitch and a group from Mayo. I think it is very practical because it minimizes all the other things that we look and continue to look for. And this is in 2005, and it really gives us a very good stratification. And I truly wish that we would use more of this algorithm in designing of our trials and take a look at the very nice stratification. And again, every other factor that we can see from pathology or from patient's performance or symptoms at performance we can, at presentation are very helpful. So the group from MD Anderson have appropriately brought up a question, can we better select patients with metastatic disease, synchronous metastatic disease, for cytoreductive nephrectomy? And they have performed this very eloquent multivariate analysis, and again, looking at the number of risk factors, we can stratify those. What I'd like to point out that patients treated with medical therapy only are a, almost the, in the very, very bottom. So it tells me two things, it, and it can be interpreted by two things. Number one is that we're just so good as doctors in selecting patients for surgery. And indeed, we have the gestalt. We look at everything. We look at all the boxes and we say, you shouldn't have it. And that's why we're just so good. It can also argue that those patients that were deprived of cytoreductive nephrectomy have truly done poorly. I know that the truth is probably in the second, uh, in the first, that we're just selecting patients appropriately, but I'm sure that a proportion of patients could have benefited from cytoreductive nephrectomy, and denying everybody cytoreductive nephrectomy up front may not necessarily be the right thing. If you look at the diagram from the public relations, and this is my last slide, if we look at the decision making, in a medicine, I think the public relation knowledge is actually quite good. This is a continuum. What we're not talking is black and white, as Dr. Bowles alluded. And if we look at a truth, we will go to persuasion, a storytelling, 
and obviously the seed. And if I had to use these four things as well, I would say that indeed a young, healthy person with a no CT4 and few mats and an ECOG zero should probably or definitely or absolutely undergo cytoreductin refractomy up front. The old frail person with a CT4 and numerous mats in different spots, including the brain, should probably not be offered cytoreductin nephrectomy. But I do think that as we do gain some uh, risk factors, as these patients do get sicker, I do think that more patients than not would likely benefit from the cytoreductin nephrectomy up front, although it certainly should not be black and white. I thank you all. This is a picture of a Syracuse and our department. Thank you.